This is another episode of the Daily Bread Bible Study here for day 115, Friday, April 24th, 2020, focusing on 2 Kings 19 through 21. When we last left off, the nation of Israel was no more. Assyria took over the region of Samaria, the city and the region, and was now pressing to take Jerusalem too. King Hezekiah of Judah was left with a hard decision, facing overwhelming forces in front of him from Assyria. What does King Hezekiah do? Well, King Hezekiah fears the Lord, so his first responsible move is to go to the house of the Lord. King Hezekiah wants to hear what God has to say and consults a priest named Isaiah. This proves to be a good call, as Isaiah becomes one of the most notable prophets in the Old Testament. The prophet, who has seen dry bones regain spirit and life, hears the Spirit of God speak a plan. 2 Kings 19.6 says, Isaiah said to them, Say to your master, thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid because of the words that you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have revealed to me. I myself will put a spirit in him, so that he shall hear a rumor and return to his land. I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. So representatives of Assyria do in fact leave, but also want to keep the pressure up on Judah. They send a message to King Hezekiah to despair even though we're moving our forces away from you. King Hezekiah again seeks God. In chapter 19, verse 14, Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. Then Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord. Prayer is pleasing to God. The prophet Isaiah again gives a message of Hope, starting in verse 32. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into this city. Shoot an arrow there, come before it with a shield, or cast up a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, he shall again return. He shall not come into the city, says the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. We see then an angel from the Lord defeats many Assyrians, and the king of Assyria retreats and is murdered by his own sons that night. Thus Judah is saved by God when they call upon God. 2 Kings 20 describes King Hezekiah living on. He becomes sick to the point of death. The prophet Isaiah carries God's message Your death is near. King Hezekiah again turns to God, pleading for his life and for God to deliver him. Moved by his humility and devotion, God changes the words for Hezekiah. 2 Kings 20 verse 6 says, I will add 15 years to your life. I will deliver you and the city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend the city for my own sake. And for the sake of my servant, David, as a son and the prophet Isaiah has time, um, as a sign, sorry, the prophet Isaiah has time turned back by 10 intervals uh, on the sundial. With new life, King Hezekiah lives to see the coming of a new entity, Babylon, seeking to uh, be hospitable. King Hezekiah shows the envoys from Babylon everything in his possession. This proves to be unwise. In 2 Kings 20, verse 16, Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Days are coming when all that is in your house, and that which your ancestors have stored up until this, until this day, shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. Some of your own sons who are born to you shall be taken away, 
They shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. We see this foreshadowing coming up. Prophet Isaiah has been right thus far, and we see that maybe this will come true too. King Hezekiah actually accepts this ill-fated news, especially since God says it will not come to pass in his lifetime. He gives thanks that it will be somebody else's concern. In chapter 21, we see after King Hezekiah of Judah dies, his son Manasseh takes over. And Manasseh has a very long tenure, 55 years. But this is also a long time of sin, as King Manasseh brings idolatry of Baal back in full force. In 2 Kings 21.9, it says, Manasseh misled them to do more evil than the nations had done that the Lord destroyed before the people of Israel. He found new and creative ways to sin. Uh, it also mentions worship of, quote-unquote, all the host of heaven. This seems to reference divine beings other than God existing in heaven. Does this mean angels or other things? Anyways, among the abominable practices are this. 2 Kings 21, 6, it says, He made his son pass through fire. He practiced soothsaying and augury and dealt with the mediums and with wizards. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. Uh, remember, the sun's passing through the fire is one of the critiques of the Egyptian god Moloch as well. But um, anyways, uh, it could be other gods as well, too. God has strong words and actions for Manasseh. He says in 2 Kings 21, verse 14, I will cast off the remnant of my heritage and give them into the hand of their enemies. They shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies because they have done what is evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their ancestors came out of Egypt, even to this day. How does this promise of destruction relate to the promise to King David? that his descendants would rule over Israel. Remember in 2 Samuel 7, 15, it said, But I will not take my steadfast love from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I put away before you. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Again, I'd like to point out that the theology of the you know, this whole section, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, the theology of it all is very different than my theology. But the two theological points that we can see very clearly here from 2 Kings is this, that God has the ability to remove favor whenever God decides. And second, God's decisions are influenced if the people earnestly seek to obey God. So when God, people fear God and respect God and show God love and obey and listen to God, then God shows mercy and graciousness. God also is not bound by any covenants of the past. Uh, covenants usually made with God in the past contain if clauses, saying if you do these things, then I will give you this. But if you worship other gods, then you will get cursed. And we see that repeated all throughout the Old Testament, setting up, you know, this idolatry leading to destruction for the people. This promise made to King David sounds like an eternal promise. We as people of the New Testament depend upon this promise. But we also see that the promise made to Saul was stripped from him rather quickly. So, where do we leave off? Well... The nation of Judah is again on the downswing once King Manasseh dies. His son, King Ammon, continues the sins of his forefathers. And King Ammon is murdered by a conspiracy. And then those conspirators are murdered by others as well. Which goes to show that when you don't follow God's ways, thou shalt not murder. Violence only ends in more violence. On the upswing, though, a young king will arise to lead a reformation for his people, a reformation for the ages. 
And we will see the book of the Lord guide the people once again next time.